Linda, welcome to National Cancer Prevention Workshop 2022. I know you've been with us for close to a decade. We're so grateful for the work that you do, not only here on Capitol Hill, but around and across the country. So thank you very much. Um, I am so excited to be here. And do you have a whole group of students that you're going to educate today, too? Yes, we do. Actually, we have uh, students tuning in from all over the country, and we're excited about that, too. I think last year we had about 100,000 viewers. So it's exciting that your work is really um, getting out there. And you're, can you share for the people that don't know you from previous workshops what you're doing? So thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you because cancer prevention is something we should all be embracing. When my husband, Alan, had a slight persistent cough, we had no clue that he was soon going to be diagnosed with an asbestos-caused cancer that would actually cost him his life. And like many people tuning in, we all want to prevent and eliminate cancer. And what if we knew what caused cancer, like smoking, can, diet, alcohol? Well, asbestos caused Alan's cancer. As a result of his diagnosis, we started a nonprofit. And for 17 years, we've been banging on doors on Capitol Hill, but also working with the media and other NGOs in the U.S. and around the world to simply raise awareness, obviously advance advocacy efforts and support the community like you do. Well, you're, you're great. I think, um, first of all, what is the link that we'll put it up on the link, the information, all of that? What is the link that people can go to now if they're watching? or right after they're watching us, what's the best link for them to go to? The really short one to write down for the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization is just the, use the acronym ADAO.US. That'll get you there where you can get educated, uh, show your support, and learn more so we can advance, especially Bill, you're the guru with this. Use social media to advance education and advocacy. And of course, share everything that people are learning from today. Like when Alan first mm -hmm. was diagnosed, Bill, we didn't even know asbestos hadn't been banned. We live in L.A., urban, educated, and we were clueless. And I found out uh, after almost 20 years of work, we're not alone. Most people think asbestos has been banned. And like other chemicals, like maybe PFAS, they don't even know what chemicals could be in their air, water, soil. You know, it's funny you say that because... When we were all live on the Capitol for year after year, we'd have hundreds of people come in. And Linda, you'd always share how you had learned, you know, late in life, really, um, that asbestos was legal in the United States. And people, everybody in that room thought, nope, it can't be. Is this true? And every year we learn of people that that so so that's why I wanted you back because I think that there are people you know so many of these things take on the natural landscapes of our lives we don't even know what's in coming or going from our lives so the work that you're doing the service that you're providing protect the public is not a only close my heart but it's so critical and can you share your latest effort in in your policy work um, with us. You bet. So obviously to shape public policy and you're a pro with that, um, Bill, you have to educate the staffers and every staffer is so buried with really important issues that raising awareness, having them understand what is asbestos, where might it be, and how do you print it? prevent exposure leads us to policy efforts. Did you know that nearly 40,000 Americans die every year? And as you said, asbestos remains legal and lethal. That means imports and use continue, but it's actually a bigger problem than that. Just to arm your viewers with information is asbestos can be found in our homes, schools, workplaces, our built environment, and even on consumer shelves. So it's been really important as Alan and the other family that co-founded ADIO, the Larkin family, if we could raise awareness, we could educate people so they could actually know where asbestos is in their world and prevent exposure, but also join the policy campaigns to ban it. So it's been a tough 
battle. I think most people, and, and you tell me what you've been hearing, Bill, but we hear a lot about Johnson & Johnson and talc baby powder. And not to minimize that, of course, that's important. But the real problem that we have is called legacy asbestos. So when there's climate change disasters, maybe you did a home repair in your beautiful home, maybe with a tornado or hurricane, there was a structure that was damaged or worse yet imploded. If asbestos is in a structure that is damaged, those, fire, those fibers can become airborne and then you can breathe them. Unfortunately, it takes 10 to 50 years from exposure to diagnosis for you to actually know that you have a disease, which is incurable. As you know, Alan fought three years and died in front of our then 13-year-old daughter and me by his side. But you work so hard to prevent cancer. And we have a, a cure for mesothelioma and other asbestos-caused cancers. Stop using asbestos and prevent exposure. So where are we with our policy? Well, you can probably see my gray hair. It's been a 17 year battle. Uh, we've never made more progress, but there are times- Which we always sign on to, by the way, which we always sign on to and endorse. And I have to say, as you talk about your 18 year old battle, Linda, for those that don't know Linda, is a force of her own. I've been in the hall with you. That one time where a legislator turned around and ran the other way down the hall, I was like, is that because of me or you? We're both of us, but it is, Linda knows you and you've knocked on thousands of doors. You have hoofed it up and down the hill, not only in our United States Capitol, but across the country. So I just wanted to add that in so people, people really understood that you have your sword out all day long and you are busy. So go ahead and, and update us on Alan's legislation. Okay, so thanks to Miles O'Brien and Less Cancer and you, Bill. Miles O'Brien, for anybody watching today, I hope we link to his great PBS segment, News Hour, because he actually did about a nine minute piece on asbestos. What is it? Where is it? And what's happening? And I think it's really helpful to have the photographs and the images and voice. So I really recommend Miles' work. But Miles and you have helped us tremendously. So where are we now? Well, we made great progress last congressional session. That means 2019 to 2020. But with COVID and everything else, the bill was not able to be taken to the House floor. But the good news is we have a new discussion draft. That means it's a work in progress. And we are very hopeful, and I'll be knocking on your door soon, that uh, Senator Merkley and Representative Bonamici will remain the champions that they have been. And we will introduce, it will be the fourth iteration of the and Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act, which bans imports and use, but also it calls for a legacy study. And that is really important to us because what if those brave firefighters that we all know and love, when they come in or when they try to fight a fire, if asbestos is in a structure, they can oftentimes be exposed or take it home on their clothing before they decontaminate. So what happens if you go in to look for your cat or your favorite photo album? you too could be exposed in a structure that's contam contaminated. So we're really excited about the legacy study. We think that that will reduce. Um, you know, let me not interrupt, but, you know, I always think about the California fires and, and my friends, our friends that are reporters that are out there covering them all the time. I'm like, what are they breathing in? Of course, they're breathing in clouds of asbestos. They're breathing in. And for the firemen, I think some of us lose sight of the fact that a lot of firemen and women are quite young. Some are in the early 20s. The endocrine systems aren't even fully baked. You know, I mean, there are, they're very, very young and they're getting harmful exposures. No, you're, you're completely right. And, can't, and firefighters are, are, are in peril, as we know. In fact, there was a NIOSH study that was done in 2013. And through that study, they determined that firefighters developed mesothelioma, which was the same cancer that Alan suffered from at twice the rate as the rest of the Americans. So we know if asbestos is in a structure and you are exposed, it can lead to disease. It's also important to know that if we educate the public like you're doing today, I'm so excited that you might, before you go into your attic to rip apart something, you might say, wait a minute, I heard at Bill's conference workshop that maybe I should have it tested. 
or maybe I should take another look, or maybe I should look at the materials that I'm using in my home. If we can advance education, it is wonderful because it complements prevention. So firefighters are, are, you're absolutely right, have been horribly uh, exposed. And you've seen what's happened in my state. They've just, those fires have ravaged us. And, and sadly, it's not going to change, but so has the southern coast of where Texas and Louisiana are, you know, where a lot of ports of entry for asbestos are. So we have, we, you know, we call them the people, vulnerable population or diversified communities. And for those communities, if you're if you live in an area like that, you might not have access to Walter Reed Medical Center or top-notch places. You might not even have money for the parking and you might not have a doctor that can diagnose you. So I think that what you're doing for cancer prevention is really important to raise the bar for awareness and prevention. And also if somebody is exposed, what's the next step? You don't write your last will and trust. You have a conversation with your physician. Well, there are, and you hope your physician knows. You know, it's tricky, especially you bring up so many issues now, like issues around disparities and really living downstream, zip code disparities where people are living and they don't have access to healthcare. They don't have access. They don't have enough information to know that where they are might be a problem. And then, you know, do they have an option? Is there an option? Is there something we can do, especially for these people that cannot help themselves or where resources um, may not be adequate? And so, and by help themselves, I'm talking about resources. And when there are no resources, that's, you know, that's the real twist in this game. Like most of us, many of us, many people we know, um, can have access to health care, can find out about things like asbestos, but there's so many more that cannot. And those are the people that, of course, we really worry about and, and, and we want to right the wrongs. They should not be living in places where exposures are unregulated, where exposures um, you know, they are not lab rats to the work that we are doing today. And we need to take better care of our communities, all our communities we need to take better care of. And But those are the ones that I especially worry about. And I think many of us do as well. Um, you know, this is really all about unnecessary and preventable exposures. And when we talk about becoming aware and looking to our environment, looking around, looking to see um where and how we're living and the things that we can do about you had talked about you know like the attic insulation uh, we just had an issue with attic insulation in a shed and i didn't feel like i knew enough about it to address it myself so i called somebody believed they were do it and they also could protect themselves they had a face mask they had appropriate safety clothing so when we ask people to check things out if they can we want to make sure that they get the appropriate people that can help that are equipped to identify if that fiberglass insulation has asbestos in it and i think you have some information on fiberglass asbestos is uh, fiberglass insulation is there still asbestos in any of that so it's very hard without testing, but I can tell you that there's attic insulation that came from Libby, Montana, that is contaminated with asbestos. So what we've done, Bill, similar to I think what Less Cancer tries to do, is we try to put our educational resources out there so they're completely accessible, but also understandable and shareable. So we actually, I'll give you the URL, it's called noasbestos.org. K N O W is we want residential, we want uh, owners to know businesses and workers, what, what rights do you have? So I've aggregated all the information from different government websites. So it's a one-stop shop for prevention, but also this past September, we made our annual conference free. We wanted to crush the barriers to education and make sure everyone could access it so our all of our conference proceedings are online like you do so we take the information we make it legacy information and shareable and i think that's what you and i try to strive to do so much is to not just spend a day but it is our mantra 
to prevent cancer. And that's one of the reasons I love working with you because you think outside the box. And I have people that will call or email me and say, Linda, I don't have money to do abatement. Like you had to probably pay someone to come out and take a look at that structure. And it's not cheap. And I don't know if they found it or they didn't find it, but sometimes people don't want to wait. They might not have the money. And if you do find it, it's expensive to do proper abatement. So we've had conversations with member of Congress, you should incentivize removing toxins from a home or structure, right? Give somebody a tax write-off at least um, so people do it the right way and they don't expose others. They're still cleaning up after yeah. Hurricane Katrina. You know, we're just not done with these natural climate change disasters and other things. So I think holding corporations mm-hmm. responsible, but also our government, and then to empower those in the healthcare industry to let them know what does it take to talk to their patients, go for treatment and record these things so that if Uncle Harry's exposed, you know down the road that maybe you also work there and you could have been exposed. It's all to advance your treatment options and more treat, better treatment can be curative for some diseases, not for asbestos caused cancers yet. But you've seen dramatic uh, increase of you know longer life and better quality. But we're, we're far from that with asbestos. Prevention is the only cure for asbestos-caused diseases. And, and it's really the big miracle out there. And it's hard, it's hard to promote because it's not tied to a very tight or specific financial model. So, you know, there are a lot of people that may say, oh, I, I don't really get it. Well, you do get it. And you don't want to always get it. But they do get it. And they do understand that you know culturally we often reach for what is profitable culturally we reach for what is convenient and um, we understand through lots of evidence-based science that um, many of the things that we're talking about over the next few days of this work are preventable and unnecessary exposures and so what we're seeing more and more since less cancer law launched in you know 2004 is that we're seeing you know increases in people wanting to make better food choices figuring out ways for people who don't have access to food choices getting them food choices and healthy food choices um you know we are every day we're figuring out something new that we can provide, where we can provide a service for people so they have access, access, access. And the one thing we can do is keep communities informed. And I'm certainly grateful for your work in doing that. And, you know, the tools of public health are unique. They're not like going to your doctor. They're unique because they involve education, they involve policies, they involve best practices. And those tools for public health are very different than what we might see in a hospital or in our doctor's office. But we know that they save lives. We know you save lives. We know the work of less cancer saves lives. And the one thing I love about all of this is that the continuing medical education credits that healthcare providers receive from this workshop helps them learn a little bit more about what you do, for instance, helps them understand asbestos. And we know that there are many healthcare providers that are still unaware that asbestos is legal and that it's around. And, um, but it's, you know, as you said, when I, when um, I asked about the fiberglass um, insulation, I was shocked. The only reason I knew there could be asbestos in the fiberglass that I have is because of our workshop and because of your work that has done so much to enlighten communities globally. So we're super grateful for your work. I want to know how myself and the audience can join you in helping you accomplish your work. Love that question. So the challenge for this moment, I would ask everybody watching this video to tweet out a fact and connect us, Bill. You know, we'll put our hashtags maybe on the bottom of this. Tweet out a fact right now that asbestos is legal and lethal. Prevention is secure. Um, As far as our work, we love big sign-on letters where we get organizations like you and Less Cancer to sign on. 
But we also have a petition with over 150,000 people urging the EPA to ban asbestos. So I would love people to follow us online, use social media, uh, grab our newsletter and support the policy to ban asbestos. If we know what causes the diseases, we owe it to everyone to stop imports and use to prevent exposure. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm to join you this this uh, in February for this important workshop because you do what is so necessary. We don't need to learn about the latest chemotherapy. We need to learn about prevention. What does that look like in our home and our workplaces? And how can we help others? How can we be, you know, campaigners and educators? And I think your workshop makes that so simple. And I'm excited to connect with your viewers after the workshop. I know, well, and I hope do reach out to you and as we do for all our collaborators, as you know, we collaborate with several people really across the country and institutions and feel really lucky to have um, so much diverse uh, support and so many people standing with us in, in this mission. I do, you know, you brought up the latest in chemotherapy. You, I know myself, for so many people that I've loved. Uh, we wish there was a cure for cancer. We wish there was a cure for the people that we loved, a fix. But even when there is a cure, people are always devastated from the diagnosis, the treatment, the financial pull, the pull on the family. We, we are in respect and honor and deeply feel for these families that are, are in the mix fighting cancer, looking for those cures. We do know... Um, that when we can cure a cancer, we can often prevent other cancers from coming back. And that is great. But I, I, I like to remind our viewers that while our focus is on prevention, we're with you on the cure. We're with you on the cure. We want it to work, but we also are aware of the immense suffering that so many people go through in this journey. And we tend to, you know, I think as a population and pleasers, people who want to please, we tend to really brush over the war that these people are involved with for the remaining parts of their lives. And it's so tough. So if we can prevent that suffering and save families from that suffering, I think there's no reason to ever slow down on the work that we're doing. That's only more fuel for the fire to keep going. I know you're you're motivated. Even during COVID, you were crisscrossing the country, um, as was I, and and busy and safe. Kept yourself safe, which was great. But um, you know, I don't know what we would do without your work, Linda. And we're so grateful for you and your efforts and the information that you provide communities and. You know, every every year you're back with with the different legislation or tweaks on the legislation. It's an awesome opportunity, especially for policymakers, to really understand how important this is. Well, I think what you touched on is really important. Before you know, for people while they're in the, in your workshop, is cancer. Although we want to have less cancer, prevent cancer, end cancer, cancer doesn't just impacts one person, the patient. It impacts the entire family. It could be a loss of income stream. It could be anticipatory grief. It could be just be the work of trying to get someone to and from chemo and caring for them. So there is a huge cost and it's not just dollars. It's time, it's energy, right. it's lost moments. And I think thinking about cancer holistically, cancer prevention is really important to have workshops and have everyone in the family understand prevention, but also treatment. You know, it's probably similar with you, Bill. When we first started ADAO, prevention was like a dirty word. Every dollar, every moment needed to go into research for a cure. And it wasn't until about 10 years ago that I was able to, with our, our organization, educate people. You can have both. You can have prevention and you can support research for a cure. They both complement each other. One without the other is Foolish is a missed opportunity, I should say. Well, no, I think, you know, when, when we work to prevent human suffering, we have to take into account the work to at least tap down on cancer risks like asbestos or PFAS or any of the number of things out there. We're still almost losing 500,000 a year um, people in the United States to smoking. 
what is it? It's like 480 or some 480,000. It's crazy. So unnecessary, so preventable, and so profitable to some people. But the cost for our country is unspeakable. So we yes. do, we, there are lots of places that we can um, put these fixes into, um, into place. And you are doing a great job. I'm super glad you could join us today. Um, we always love seeing you and we love your work. And any way that we can help you, please let us know and we'll share your information on the screen. I love that. And in parting, you bring together lawmakers, remind them that we need legislation to ban asbestos because it is bipartisan. There is no party behind this. And you bring all the lawmakers together. So let's see if we can corral them and make change happen together, Bill. I love working with you and all That's of these great. amazing people.